Hello, Andrew. Hi, how are you? Good, good, and you? Yes, very well, thank you. Good, do you just want to try uh, sharing your screen and just make sure that... Uh... Um... Yeah, that, that we can see it nicely. Maybe just forward uh, one or two slides. Yeah, that's great. That looks perfect. Um, yeah, if you can just stop sharing, I've got like one slide to introduce you and then um, uh, I'll stop sharing again. Okay. And you will start in about five minutes, huh? Perfect, no problem. Just, just um, Malin, how long do you want me? How long do you want me to talk for? Uh, don't worry. I mean, how long is your talk? Half an hour? Yeah, about half an hour. There about. Yeah, that's perfect. Yeah, and after that, then I'll just ask for some comments from our consultants if there are any questions. Okay, perfect. Yeah, yeah let me know if, if we're running out of time or if the story. No, no, that's no, no. I mean, we. I mean, minimum it's one hour. Um, okay. But, but, oh, so you've got lots of time. Okay. Now that's yeah, perfect. Yeah. Cool. Cool. No, no. It's it's five to six. At least five to six. Okay. No, perfect. Cool. Okay. Andrew, can you see my first slide? Yes, I can see it, yeah. You can see it, huh? 
Okay, it's See just second. after five o'clock. We can start. Huh? Um, okay. Hi, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thank you for attending our meeting of the Department of Pediatric Surgery in East London. Today, uh, we have Dr. Andrew Grieve, uh, who is going to give a talk on pediatric inguinal hernia is laparoscopy for everyone. And uh, to introduce Dr. Grieve, uh, he is a consultant pediatric surgeon at Nelson Mandela Children's Hospital in Johannesburg. He is also senior lecturer in pediatric surgery in, um, in uh, Wits University in Johannesburg. He did his MBCHB uh, in Wits University in 2002 and fellowship in pediatric surgery in 2012. He has keen interest in research. He has multiple articles published in peer-reviewed scientific journals and two chapters. Uh, he has participated in multiple international collaborations for various research projects. He has started uh, this Discover Pediatric Surgery podcast, which have published at least a dozen uh, podcasts on different common pediatric surgical topics. And um, in his personal life, he is a keen mountain biker and enjoys time on the golf course. So we are really happy uh, to have Dr. Grieve talking to us on um, laparoscopic repair of inguinal hernia in children. And I stop sharing and I'll ask Dr. Grieve to give his talk. Okay, Andrew. Afternoon, everybody. Thank you very much, Prof. Titness, for inviting me to come and speak with everybody today. Um, I'm just going to talk to you about some of our sort of local experience and perspectives in terms of, you know, inguinal hernias and how we've changed our, our perspectives on how we manage these patients and, you know, what some of our outcomes have been like. Um, I'll give you a little bit of a brief introduction as well to some of the way things have been done in the past, um, you know, what the potential laparoscopic options are. And as I said, what, what we are doing um, in, in our center in, in Johannesburg. Um, for those of you who don't really know me, I, I'm a pediatric surgeon, as, as Prof mentioned, I do most of my practice at the Nelson Mandela Children's Hospital, which is a relatively new um, hospital in, in Johannesburg. Um, and uh, yeah, it's quite exciting times. There's obviously been lots of teething issues as, as every new place has, uh, but yeah, it's, it's a, an exciting place, place to work. Um, so, I mean, just a bit of background, I'm sure most people, most people remember, um, you know, the, the reason that we have these types of hernias in kids essentially is that the process of vaginalis sort of develops, you know, post-conception, and uh, usually by the third trimester, the process of vaginalis invaginates right down into the scrotum, assisting with testicular descent. Um, you know, they reckon about obliteration of about 80% of the process of uh, vaginalis happens in males before birth, um, and probably about 60% in females. Um, but in reality, nobody really knows what the obliteration rates are. Um, and some centers reckon there's at least 63% of males still have a patent process of vaginalis up to eight weeks of life. Um, clinically, however, you know, it's, it's um, the right side is definitely more common than the left, and that's because it closes later. And they reckon about 25% of premature boys might have a, a process of vaginalis that remains patent, and up to about 5% in kids that are born at term. Um, and we know these are obviously responsible for developing inguinal hernias, hydrocele's, um, and they also implicated as well in testicular descent issues uh, in kids with undescended testes. So, I mean, the first description of inguinal hernias dates back to 1500 BC. Um, and uh, the Egyptians had quite good documentation of inguinal hernias. Um, and there's even descriptions of uh, the Egyptians operating on inguinal hernias, um, you know, thousands of years ago. You know, one of the mainstays of treatment was really pressure bandages. And this is described 
routinely up until the 20th century where people would wear corsets or bandages to, to keep hernias in place. And there's still many cultures in South Africa that still, you know, use pressure garments and those things for umbilical hernias in young kids. So it's not an unknown phenomenon even to this day. Um, you know, mm -hmm. as I said, the, the, you know, the fear is described, um, you know, inguinal hernia repairs being done, and there's a few mummies that have got, uh, that we've discovered that have actually got Ingle hernias, um, you know, when they open them up, and some of the pharaohs actually had uh, fecal fistulae coming out their scrotum, who obviously had strangulated ingle hernias that then ruptured, um, and and uh, you know, it's probably the cause of these of their death ultimately. Um, you know, surgery was obviously reserved in those days for you know inguinal scrotal hernias only, and those that were reducible. If it was incarcerated or strangulated, they felt that was in unmanageable and unoperable. Um, and even the routine sort of repairs, obviously, there's a high mortality rate. Um, you know, as in today, you can see in this picture, you know, there's a, there's a, a large team that's involved in operating in inguinal hernias. And um, obviously, in those days, it, most of the people involved in assisting were there to hold the, the patient down, whereas today we have the, the help of the anesthetists to hold the patient down. So... In, uh, you know, uh, Celsius, obviously, the, you know, we use, you know, the degrees Celsius. All the time. Um, but he was also one of the first people that really described the different types of hernias, uh, direct versus indirect hernias. Um, and these descriptions are still used today, still very prevalent today. So it's, it's fascinating that you know, these guys, even at the turn of the century, really started to have some understanding of what, um, was going on, what, you know, what hernias were, were all about. Um, and there's a surgeon in the, the early, early AD from Egypt who actually has got a really clear description of inguinal hernias and how to repair them. And it's interesting just to read it. An incision is made up to the peritoneum. The margins of the incision are kept separate by hooks. An assistant pulls the testicle to one side while the operator carefully examines and separates the spermatic cord, stops the bleeding. The testicle is placed in the scrotum before removing the sac. Adhesions are treated and the intestines and the momentum are put back into place. The sac is lifted, twisted on itself, and then cut. And I'm sure many of you can, you know, um, uh, um, relate to this description of an inguinal hernia repair and say this was done at, at the turn of, uh, you know, uh, AD. Um, Galen in uh, 176 AD started to actually have a good understanding of anatomy and actually was one of the first people to really describe the differences between, you know, hernias, um, hydrocele's, non-communicating hydrocele's. And, you know, as time went on, obviously people developed more and more of an understanding about what the anatomy was and how this, um, what this implied when it comes to actually fixing inguinal hernias. This is from a, a textbook of surgery in 1363. And these were the described methods about how one could fix a hernia in those days. Um, and there's some very interesting descriptions, you know, from cauterization of the external swelling with a red hot iron. Um, and, you know, you, you sometimes shudder when you think about how these, <laughs> how these were done, um, especially with very primitive, you know, anesthetic, applying of a transcutaneous suture around the spermatic cord, tying it on external wooden slats until the cord becomes sectioned. Um, you know, there's, there's some obviously very effective methods, but very crude when it comes to, to repairing hernias. Uh, but the last one is, is quite, a, quite an interesting one. You know, after incision, they applied a golden thread around the spermatic cord to tie it just enough to ensure closure of the hernia sac without compromising the vascularization and the function of the testis. And you start to see how people realize the importance of preserving the other structures in the inguinal canal. And this was starting to shine through um, but obviously techniques were crude still at that stage. With the, the modern era of surgery sort of coming to the forefront um, in, the, the, in the 20th century, you know, they applied sort of basic principles when it came to hernia repair. And the three basic rules where they started introducing, you know, focus on an antiseptic and aseptic procedures, you know, high ligation of the hernial sac and narrowing of the internal ring. Um, and, you know, the, one of the well-known described methods, I'm sure, especially people who've had training in general surgery, will know that Bassini was a very well-described uh, way of fixing inguinal hernias. 
And the descriptions, you know, based on his technique um, were used in children as well as in adults. And there's a report of 371 cases published in 1898, children under 14 years of age, and they only had three recurrences, which for those days was a remarkable, a remarkably low incidence of recurrence. Um, but, you know, as time went on, you know, Laird and Gross uh, also described, you know, inguinal hernia repairs and what this meant in children. And I, I think they kind of, you know, really started to understand that there was a, a major difference between the pediatric inguinal indirect hernia and the direct inguinal hernias of adulthood. And they then tailored their surgery um, to be less invasive, less um, muscular uh, opposing, and really focusing on this patent process of vaginalis and actually having very good results. Um, what they did do though is they, they closed their patent and process of vaginalis at the external ring, uh, which they themselves later came to understand might be a reason to have a, a high recurrence rate for inguinal hernias. Um, when it comes to uh, you know, laparoscopic repair, um, you know, the first laparoscopic hernia repair was actually described in, in adults, um, mainly in females, and it was in, only in 1982 that the first described repair was done. And you can see from the radiograph that they used uh, clips. The, the canal. Um, in pediatrics, the first one was done in females as well, um, and they basically sutured the ring closed. Um, they did, you know, there was they didn't have any recurrences in in the children that they did at this stage, but and they were all done in females. And the the first sort of real description about all encompassing pediatric surgical inguinal hernia repairs was done by a group in Italy, um, and they essentially did purse string sutures. This is in 1998, 1999. So it was a you know not long after the first inguinal hernia repairs were done. But what they did high, find is that they had a relatively high recurrence rate using per string sutures. And it was about four and a half percent that they had, whether it was related to the type of sutures that they were doing or the way that they did the per string technique, um, they felt that you know, it wasn't matching an open repair. So they weren't hundred percent convinced that most people around the world at this stage were a little bit skeptical about doing laparoscopic inguinal hernia repairs. So many different variations came about you know, ways to try and improve or decrease the, the recurrence rates. And there was, you know, very interesting uh, names for these things. The flip flap hernioplasty, was essentially immobilized part of the peritoneum, flapped it over and closed it to try and, you know, cover the, the, the defect in the, in the uh, canal. Um, sadly, also having a very high recurrence rate and some fair morbidity when it comes to to bleeding and issues in these in these particular style, um, you know, people have thought about real novel and interesting ideas when it comes to fixing these single hernia repairs, and uh, a couple of a couple of you know um, centers were were trying um, animal models using uh, glue uh, tissue adhesives to close patent process vaginalysis. And these guys actually had very good um, success. Uh, the guys in, in Japan, Yamataka, also published um, a paper in 2005 using um, Dermabond to close inguinal hernia repairs. And you know, these looking for simple, easy ways to, to fix hernias, laparoscopically assisted, um, injecting Dermabond in. And they found they had very good uh, closure rates. Um, but what they subsequently have found is that the actual tissue adhesive itself um, it can have some detrimental side effects when it comes to fertility down the line. And the, the, the glue itself seems to impact and damage the spermatic cord um, of, uh, you know, in the kids that were, were treated with, um, with these uh, injections of, of the agent. So it's probably kind of fallen out of favor and it's, it's, you know, whether we can look for other alternatives to make it simpler, um, you know, you know, it's something just to be aware of, I suppose, when it comes to novel techniques and, and what the potential unexpected side effects may or may not be, um, you know, when we do these types of things. Um, there's, you know, very uh, simple but novel and very effective um, options that have, that have been done. 
um, an inversion of uh, of uh, the the canal of neck in females. There's a very you know a simple but effective and clever way of fixing this. Um, essentially, grabbing the canal, everting it, putting an endo loop through, and then just transecting it. Um, there are some centers that um, let me see if I can get this to play. That essentially, um, you know, through a single port, do the same principle, everting, inverting, should I say, the canal, just cauterizing it, and essentially leaving it to that, and that's the end of their treatment, and showing very good, uh, good results and low recurrence rates. I'm not sure if any of you guys have, have tried that technique as a single port incision. So, you know, the, after doing lots of reading and lots of sort of consideration, um, the, you know, the percutaneous internal ring suture um, was, was something that seemed to be gaining a lot of traction around the world. Um, and there's been lots of publications around this, and this was first described in, in 2016. Um, very low recurrence rates, much lower than a lot of the other sort of sutured versions, uh, about 1.4%. Uh, recurrence rate, which is probably close to most people's open experiences. Um, the interesting, they also found a, a contralateral hernia of about 16% um, in, the, in the repairs when they did them. Um, I will just, in the, just have for a descriptive way, I'm not sure how many people have got experience in this, um, but Professor Ponsky described this and he's going to bring us a video on this. Um, so I'll just let it run just for a few minutes. I'm not sure if you guys can hear the audio or not. Uh, no, we can't hear the audio. We can see the uh, the video. Okay, I'll just talk you through it. So essentially what they're doing is they use a tiny skin incision in the groin um, and they put a one to two millimeter skin incision, uh, use a, a spinal needle, curved spinal needle, put a proline suture through uh, and then put another proline through on the second side and basically use it as a snare to pull it through. And then what they do is they exchange the proline with Ethibond. Um, and what they found is that the Ethibond is more durable in terms of the longevity of the repairs, um, but the proline slides better through the needles. So this is just an example of one of the ones that they, they have done. So they use an 18 gauge spinal needle he just curves it gently. He says if it makes it too sharp the curve, then the proline doesn't really slide through. Um, so they prefer using proline because it uh, slides nicely and it's quite firm, so it's easy to manipulate um, intracorporeally. And then usually just trims the edges so that the tips are nice and straight, so it's easy to place them in the needle. So what he does is he normally lines the tips, he sees it retrograde. He says he doesn't need to crimp the suture at the end if he does it this way, he just pulls it up to the tip of the needle, but tries not to pull it into the needle because then it's hard to push back into the abdomen. This is usually uses a three millimeter camera. So, so because of this, he uses a various uh, needle and he puts in a strip, step trocar to place it. And place the abdomen to about 15 millimeters of mercury. This is, this is a new addition to his armamentarium where he puts in another three millimeter uh, stab incision. And the reason that he did that is because they found that if they cauterize or injure part of the peritoneum, they found there's better durability um, in their repair. So even if they cut the stitch out about six weeks or six to 12 weeks, they find that the hernia still stays intact. So what they've started doing now is scoring the anterior surface before doing the, the actual repair. And he finds a, an incision just at the 
of the canal, puts a little needle in. But once they find the location, they just make a tiny little nick and then they use some local anesthetic, the hydrodacic. And the whole idea is to lift the peritoneum off the vessels and the, and the vast difference. It usually starts laterally and then goes immediately. And then he puts in his curved three needle and then So you basically say he's always standing on the left hand side of the patient. So he starts to actually put uh, put it in. There's above the, the vessel, and then pushes the loop inside the peritoneal cavity. You can see it pushing in, and he pulls it out, and then he crimps the suture to the to the drape. And then he goes immediately, he uses the Maryland just to help stabilize the peritoneum to help him do the dissection. And then it stays above the vast And since if there's any worry about you know, going either catching the vessels or the vest, you can just skip a skip lesion and he puts the needle through the loop, which is the push the, the proline in the second needle. And then basically use it like a lasso just to pull the to pull the, the loop around. And he's got a loop proline all the way around. So some people do use proline, but they found better results, better durability uh, with um, with braided sutures. And also, he says the lot the nut is a lot softer on the iffy bond, so then they rather use the if he wants. So he carries on showing a few different, he carries on showing a few different sort of versions of what he's done. Um, so you know, it's a very interesting you know, novel, relatively simple technique that you can use in, in almost all sort of indirect or hernias. I mean, just to give you some idea, this was published um, last year. Um, by one of the endoscopic groups. And this is essentially all the current sort of described methods in terms of doing inguinal hernia repairs uh, endoscopically. There's obviously a whole lot of intracorporeal suture techniques and then some extracorporeal suture techniques. Um, and you can see there's, I mean, they've kind of, you know, changed over time. Um, you know, with, with, for example, the Bernier technique was the one that you described, you know, with the inversion and cauterization. And then different people have changed the way that they use needles and describe different needles. Uh, Ponsky's kind of added hydrodissection to this uh, percutaneous internal ring suture. And now he's added cauterization as well to the, to the, uh, the ventral aspect of the, of the peritoneal cavity to try and improve the durability. So, you know, what we did is we, we started um, at, at the Nelson Mandela Children's Hospital. And so just to give you some idea, the hospital's only been open since 2017. Um, they've only started admitting surgery killed patients from about 218 after 2018. Um, the hospital is equipped to hold about 220 patients. Uh, about 56 of those are ICU beds. Although it's not commissioned to that level at the moment, it's only commissioned to 100 beds. Um, and essentially what they did in, in 2005 is they looked for, you know, where was the need for um, pediatric services within Gauteng and within the country. Um, and what they found is, uh, you know, a real ICU is a real rate limiting factor in a lot of hospitals, as well as access to theater space. So that's where the hospital is primarily yeah. sort of focused on. Um, there's obviously general surgery, there's neurosurgery, there's ENTs, cardiothoracic surgery, and there's also cardiology, nephrology, neurology, radiology, PICU and NICU, and obviously anesthetics, all those supporting services. Um, so we started, as I said, in, in June 2018, um, and we've, uh, you know, it was the Nelson Mandela Centenary, so we did a big push, you know, in July to kind of get a lot of cases done, and we did lots of work from that perspective. 
Um, um, and then, you know, since then we've been had lots of hiccups in terms of not being able to operating, having operational issues, but our general trend is to increase in the numbers year on year in terms of the, the work that we managed to do as general surgical units. Um, so what we did, a, you know, about two months ago is we just, out of interest sake, we went back and looked at our subset of inguinal hernia repairs. And since we've opened, we've done 218 inguinal hernias. Uh, as you can see, the majority of those are done in males uh, and a smaller number in females. Interesting, as, a, as an aside, we did a little um, an audit just to see what the kind of waiting list was for the patients that we've managed to get onto the list. And we took patients from the other academic hospitals within Gauteng, um, so uh, Pretoria and Johannesburg. Uh, we basically you know, asked them for permission and we got patients from their waiting list. And what we found is that the average time for kids being, from being seen um, at a pediatric surgical center until actually getting the operation average time was about 10 months. Um, but some of the kids had waited up to six years for their operation before they managed to, to get a, the operation done. And this was just for the inguinal hernias, not looking at all the other subsets of, of um, elective patients. Um, in terms of the laterality, the majority of them were on the right-hand side, um, uh, but yeah, two thirds of those, one third were on the left and then bilateral as well as about just over 40 kids that were there. When we looked at the age of the kids that we operated on, we found that over 31% of them were under one year of age. So you can see there's a, a market sort of pickup rate of kids at that particular age, even with the, the waiting times of, of kids getting. So we only started um, doing laparoscopic inguinal hernia repairs um, in earnest, I suppose, from uh, August 2020. Before then, we kind of dabbled intermittently with various techniques, but we started this PERS technique then. Um, we did, in the time period from, from the start, our whole cohort, we did 170 open inguinal hernia repairs. Um, we did 47 laparoscopic repairs. We've done quite a few more since then. Uh, we had one laparoscopic uh, that was converted to open in, a, in, a, in a, a surgeon who was doing it for the first time and they were feeling a bit nervous and there wasn't any backup with them um, at that stage. So they felt more comfortable just to convert it to a... To a an open procedure. Um, this is just to show you that you know the textbooks describe these beautiful sort of simple repairs, um, but not all hernia repairs um, are as they show in the textbook. Um, this was a kid who had previous incarceration, had quite an injected uh, peritoneum, um, but it gave us a nice opportunity to do the procedure laparoscopically. We hydrodissected before and doing the same thing uh, using the, the needle to go, to go around. Uh, just to hydrodissect and there's the curved uh, spinal needle. Um, and those, I know the orientation's a bit to the side, so that's why those look like the vessels, but those are not the vessels, the vessels are more medial. You can see them sitting there nicely over there. Uh, and the peritoneum was stuck to the vessels, so we actually did a, a skip over the vessels and the vas. So we've actually used uh, nylon, um, 2 nylon for our, um, uh, our initial suture. And we do it basically just based on the cost thing. So we looked for the cheaper versions about what we could or couldn't potentially use. Um, and then immediately the same thing. So hydrodissect and then put the spinal needle around. And so this kid, it was quite you know, stuck to the pregnant cavity. So we did the same thing. We did a, a skip over the vas and then into the, uh, the gap in between and then caught the, caught the loop. And the point of the video was really to show that they, you know, some of them can be a bit of a fiddle, it can be a bit of a learning curve to, to doing these. Um, but it's, you know, it's a, a good experience and um, we've had, you know, uh, it's been good for all of our teams to, to get to grips with doing all of these types of things. But that was that, and then we exchanged it for an Ethibon suture as well. Um, so, at this stage, we've got no identified recurrences in all the patients that we've seen. Uh, we've had very positive uh, feedback. And the, the main thing really has been the, the decreased use of post-operative analgesia for these patients. Um, cosmetically as well, the families have been very, very happy with the results. Um, but it's remarkable how uh, happy they are in terms of, let's say, the, the pain. 
So we're doing a few more studies to look at um, things going now. We've got some undergraduate students looking at the costs um, and looking at theater time. So the way our hospital works, we've got access to all that data. So we're going to basically see what the cost implications are of doing it open versus laparoscopically, seeing what the theater utilization is like, what the time in theater is like, and the cost of consumables, the anesthetic times, all those things we're going to look at. And we're also busy looking at a retrospective review and uh, patient follow-up to see you know, if there's any other recurrences that have developed over time. Um, so that's where we are at the moment. Um, and I just wanted to leave this uh, statement with you. I mean, this, this was written in the, the 1300s, but you know, I think this in many ways still holds true for, for surgeons and particularly I think in pediatric surgeons. Um, and, he, and this gentleman talks about what the conditions are necessary for a surgeon to be. There's four, four states really. The first should be that the, the surgeon should be learned. The second is that he should be an expert, obviously he, she. Uh, the third is that he should be ingenious. And the fourth is that he should be able to adapt himself. Um, it's required for the first, the surgeon should know, not only the principles of surgery, but also those, also those of medicine and theory and in practice. The second, that he should have seen others operate. The third, that he should be ingenious, good judgment and memory to recognize conditions. And for the fourth, that he should be adaptable and able to accommodate himself to circumstances. As it let the surgeon be bold in all things and fearful in dangerous things. Let him avoid all faulty treatments and practices. He ought to be gracious to the sick, considerate to his associates, cautious to his prognostications, and let him be modest, dignified, gentle, uh, pitiful, and merciful. Um, uh, don't just money, but rather, you know, your reward is in your work. Um, and to the means of the patient, to the quality of the issue, and to his own dignity. And I think those are very important things for us to remember, especially when trying novel techniques, new ideas, um, we need to advance, but we also need to be cautious about what we're doing and where we're going. Thanks very much. I know I, I see there's a few guys in the audience that have obviously had some experience in laparoscopic or you know, hernia repairs and those things. Um, I'm going to hand back to Prof, but I don't know if anybody's going to comments or statements that they'd like to like to make. Yes, yes. I will. I will invite their comments, Andrew. Thank you. That was an excellent talk uh, overview about inguinal hernia. Uh, the history of repair and uh, the advent of uh, laparoscopic repair. So I congratulate you for uh, establishing pediatric surgery at the Nelson Mandela Children's Hospital. And, uh, and uh, it, it's, it was a new venture and uh, it, uh, you really taken it uh, forward. So I see Professor Samaj Sheikh is here and he has been here since the beginning. So I just uh, ask him to comment first. So Samaj. Thank you, Malin. Uh, thank you, Andrew. I think this is a very good demonstration of how uh, you should do things, especially new and novel things. Uh, what Andrew has shown very nicely is that they saw an opportunity to learn a new technique that would probably benefit their patients. They went ahead and did that. And now they are auditing exactly what they did. So in a couple of months, they will be able to make an informed decision as to whether this is a good decision, a bad decision, or a decision that they can continue to uh, promote. The other thing I really liked was uh, the video clips. They were short and to the point. I'm sure they're very good for the junior staff because it shows you all the important uh, aspects that are there. Uh, from my side, I, I don't. I only do laparoscopic inguinal hernia repairs for recurrent inguinal hernias which fortunately in my case is very infrequently. The main reason for that is simply from a cost point of view. So I'd be very interested in finding out what an objective cost benefit to this uh, entire procedure is. Uh, based on private practice and medical aid figures, the cost of uh, in laparoscopic inguinal hernia repair uh, about three to five times that of an open repair. Uh, these are comparing uh, like surgeons to like surgeons. So basically comparing my laparoscopic technique to open technique. And what we find there is that the time taken to do the procedure in an open fashion versus the time taken to do it laparoscopically is pretty much the same. So the cost comes in from the consumables related to the laparoscopy. So I think that would be a very interesting uh, uh, paper from uh, Andrew's group once they've done the, uh, once they've looked at cost. But overall, I think it's a very good uh, discussion. It is something that only registrars who are adept at doing them open should endeavor to try. 
and it is a skill that I think all pediatric surgeons should have. So it was a good talk by Andrew. Thanks, uh, Malin. Yes, uh, thank you, Samar. I think uh, you have also brought out uh, two important things. One is auditing. And secondly, this is such a common problem that we need to be proficient in doing a safe opening vinyl hernia repair before you uh, go to laparoscopic repair. Um, I see there is a question from Dr. George Nock. Uh, Andrew, if I can answer that question, please do you use the same skin incision when putting in the sutures? Yeah, so the so the the groin or the uh, right iliac fossa or left iliac fossa sort of stab incision. Uh, so you saw, uh, um, my brain's gone, but you saw in the video. Um, so where we do the hydrodissection, the local anesthetic, uh, that's the same place where we use to put the spinal needle in and then the sutures. And then when we exchange it for the epibond, it ends up being that same little two or one millimeter incision. And um, once we've tied the epibond and snuck it down, we usually close uh, over the, the knot itself, just a subcutaneous uh, suture with some bicor. And then we usually just use tissue glue just to close that little edge. Um, and then obviously the umbilical port you need to close as well. But essentially the patient's left with um, you know, umbilical port plus the two small or single groin incision, depending if it's unilateral or bilateral. But yeah, Prof, I mean, just to go back to Prof Sheikh's comments, um, so I think the financial thing will be an interesting um, thing. I think the biggest sort of time factor or biggest cost factor when it comes to especially private practice is theater time. Um, so in our sort of, you know, things that we've looked at so far, I suspect it may be very cost effective for bilateral inguinal hernias. It may not be cost effective for uh, single sided inguinal hernias. But yeah, once we've got all the data, we'll, we'll share it and it'll be very interesting one way or another. Um, and the nice thing is that we cost all of our patients for everything and every, you know, and uh, whether they, they stay to all private patients, they're all in the same facility, the same as you would for private uh, patients in a private facility. So we've got access to big numbers so we can look at all the data and see what's happening. Yeah. Okay, Andrew, that's very good. I see uh, Dr. Derek Harrison has also been present. So Derek, Derek Harrison is a consultant pediatric surgeon in, in Barabanath Hospital, Johannesburg. So Derek, your comments? Uh, hi, Melind. Um, so unfortunately, I haven't done this technique. I've actually heard Andrew's talk before but I couldn't resist listening to it again. It's excellent. And maybe it gives me a bit of motivation to try this at some point, but no, no sorry. Unfortunately, I don't have any experience in, in doing it, uh, this technique. Okay, okay, Derek, thank you. I see uh, Dr. Hansraj Mangre, pediatric surgeon from Peter Barrettsburg. He could join quite late, but I'm sure he has got experience and comments to make about uh, laparoscopic repair of inguinal hernia, Hansi. Hello, Ansi. Hello. Hi, yes, go ahead. Yeah, no, so, uh, so thanks uh, to Andrew and yourself. And uh, unfortunately, I missed the beginning of the talk, but uh, essentially just um, on the similar line that uh, Andrew's presented, I mean, we presented our stats um, in 2019 at SARPS using uh, the sort of purse technique to close uh, inguinal hernias and we've been doing it, I think we've got in excess of 200 cases now. And uh, Sanele Madziba has just published uh, our experience in uh, SAJS that should come out sometime this month. But um, essentially, uh, you know, with regards to time, we are looking at an average of about seven minutes for unilateral and about 12 to 15 minutes for bilateral inguinal hernias. And that will definitely impact on uh, the cost factor. The other thing is that um, considering um, local anesthetic versus uh, regional. So in these kids, we were not we not doing um, sort of cordals as compared, uh, you know, to the open cases, and we we're just doing local anesthetic over the the wound sites. And um, so a similar principle to what Andrew was talking about, but we not. Uh, 
I, I haven't found the need to use hydro dissection, but I know it's uh, one of the recommended techniques and, um, you know, it uh, obviously will then depend on the surgeon's preference. And um, we've had to use an additional port in uh, one of the cases where the bladder then tracked into the inguinal canal. And, uh, you know, we had to sort of dissect that off. But uh, apart from that, uh, recurrences we had so far were three. And, uh, you know, the, the other things that we, uh, we saw, uh, uh, you know, if you end up injuring the, the surrounding vessels and we ended up with, we had three hematomas and then just local uh, sort of port site uh, complications with the with, um, granulomas. But thanks for that. Okay, Hansi, thank you. Um... I'll ask Dr. Yashoda Manikchan, a consultant pediatric surgeon in East London, to give her comments. Yashoda? Hi, Prof. Yes, thank you. And thank you for the talk. It was really fascinating to see the history of the repairs as well. Um, yeah, I haven't done the PERS. Um, I haven't tried the PERS technique, but I, I, I hear that Hansi has a lot of experience in the laparoscopic, and I just want to ask him if that's intracorporeal first string sutures that he's doing and not the PERS or, um, yeah, the technique that Dr. Grieve is using, because I've done those and it seems to me the same kind of, um, yeah, I, I don't see a big difference in um, if you have two pots and you do an intracorporeal purse string. Um, yeah, but it's really great to have uh, different and novel techniques in a surgeon's armamentarium. And um, I also look forward to seeing the study and to see how much, how well they did. And then one question to him is, what is the learning curve that he's finding, especially with the juniors uh, registrars in using the, this, the PERS technique in particular? Be interesting to know. So maybe Andrew can answer about learning curve. Yeah, so I think um, so we get a variety of registrars and obviously some are relatively junior and some are more senior. Um, I think there is a fair learning curve. I mean, the, it's, it's um, I think those have got a fair amount of laparoscopic experience are pretty good. Um, but even for them, there's, there's and the, the big learning curve it really is around getting the needle to do what you want it to do. Um, you know, we haven't had a lot of sort of issues in terms of complications or, you know, vessel injuries or those types of things with the, with the trainees, but it's really a time factor so that they understand what's happening on the screen, how that's relating to their hands at a, at a satellite sort of place, as it were. Um, and I suppose it's all about sort of the dexterity in those types of things, uh, because it's not really direct view, as it were. Um, so it's more time factor. So it definitely takes the trainees for the first couple, you know, at least two to three times longer to do those procedures. And that may obviously influence some of our results uh, when we come to actually audit the whole thing. Um, but it's a very good thing to, to practice. It's, as you said, it's a good skill to have. Um, I mean, I think, you know, it, it's controversial. I mean, it's hard to know why this technique has, seems to have a lower recurrence rate than an intracorporeal suturing technique. When in principle, you're doing virtually the same thing. Um, I'm not sure whether it's the, the as with the deep bites, you know, on the on the ventral side that sort of, you know, seems to hold better than than just the peritoneal cavity on the ventral side. Um, I'm not sure. It's hard to know why the one is, seems to be more successful than the other. Um, but yeah, you know, when I was a registrar, we 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 actually did some intracorporeal laparoscopic hernia repairs. Um, and I was very keen to do it, but um, there was a lot of controversy around it, and we, I, you know, we didn't get a lot of uh, sort of support locally, and we basically had to abandon doing it, <laughs> which is why it, we we eventually took it up a bit later to try and uh, to get with it and see how things are going. So yeah, it's interesting to hear what other people around the country are doing and what their what the results are like and what their experience is like. Yeah. Andrew, before I ask you to answer this question from my friend, Dr. Beda Espinoza from Philippines, um, I just want to tell you that uh, we used to use this laparoscopic inguinal hernia and or hydrocele repair 
as a training uh, procedure. So we used to have a laparoscopic trainer. We had set up uh, levels. So each one of us had to attain a specific level before we were allowed to do uh, laparoscopic inguinal hernia repair. And we did intracorporeal suturing and um, we, it was a very nice training model. But somehow later on with increasing time uh, constraints and number of patients, we just lost uh, that, uh, that skill, which is, which is a bit of a pity. Uh, but I would like you to answer this question. Um, is there any indication to use mesh in laparoscopic hernia repair in older children or adolescents almost who are close to adulthood? I think it really depends on what you feel the mechanism is for the that hernia and that older group. Um, I mean, uh, Ponsky and his group are using no mesh uh, per technique in kids up to between 16 and 18 if they feel it's an indirect inguinal hernia. Um, so I think the only ones we would consider using a mesh for in the pediatric population are those with some other comorbidities. So um, connected tissue abnormalities, um, you know, recurrent uh, inguinal hernias where, you know, there's no sort of discernible way to close the canal or a very, um, you know, oblique open canal. Um, but, you know, I think the, yeah, only in those cases. Um, you know, at what age do you stop doing this repair and, and do routine sort of adult type, you know, mesh, uh, you know, muscular bulking? It's also very controversial. Um, I mean, in our experience, as you see, most of the kids are, are much younger. And part of this is because we're in a pediatric hospital, so we don't really get exposed to the adult trainers. And also the way our practices are set up in Johannesburg, so between 14 and 16, they migrate to adult services. So we don't really see those older kids to, to get that perspective. Um, but yeah, in the younger kids, it would be for those reasons. Yes, we have also not used uh, mesh for inguinal hernia repair uh, ever. I think we have hardly used mesh only for ventral hernias, uh, that too, uh, like, like a case or two cases at the most. I will now ask Dr. Selo Machaya, our other consultant pediatric surgeon in East London, to give his comments. Selo. Uh, thanks, Rob, and thanks, Andrew, for the talk. Very enlightening. Um, my question might end up being one your last uh, comments on this topic, um, which is exactly what you asked initially. Is laparoscopic uh, inguinal hernia for everyone, whether they should do it for unilateral, bilateral, or whether you should reserve it for patients where we're already doing laparoscopy for whatever reasons. And incidentally, they have an associated inguinal hernia and we fix it at that time. What, what do you think is the way? Should we do it for everyone or should we select our patient population that we want to do this in? So, I mean, I, I think if you've got the skills and you've got the... Um, you know, the setup to do it and you're not constrained, you know, if it is a financial thing, I suspect you should do it for everybody. Um, I mean, I think, you know, there's obviously, you know, those the way there's a contraindication to doing laparoscopy or something, you know, that's a different story. Um, but I, I, you know, the, the same as those other reports, I mean, you know, it, it's, uh, I mean, it's obviously a controversial thing, but, you know, it is nice to be able to see the contralateral ring and see whether it is open or closed. Um, without having to do an incision on the other side. Um, we've been surprised in some kids, we, you know, young kids, you know, uh, females, left-sided hernias, we, we basically told the parents, we, we were pretty sure we're gonna fix the hernia on the right-hand side and the, and the canal was closed. So, you know, there are um, lots of benefits doing it that way. Um, patient pain, patient recovery, cosmesis, you know, all of those things are very beneficial. Um, so I, you know, I don't see a lot of reasons not to be doing it. So say if you've got the skill set and you've got the, the setup to do it. Um, so I, you know, the, the guys in the States are advocating to not reduce um, irreducible hernias um, or incarcerated hernias and to just take them straight to theatre and doing the repairs um, laparoscopically there and then. Um, you know, we haven't done that um, to this stage. 
there's some controversy about you know small patent process of analysis and hydro seals. So we had three kids where we fixed their their patent process vaginalis with hydro seals that got a recurrence in, in terms of a hydro seal, and we actually treated them conservatively and they resolved over time. But that's also a very controversial area when it comes to laparoscopic hernia repairs. Um, but yeah, I don't see a lot of negativities unless there's um, unless there's as a contraindication to actually doing laparoscopy for a patient um, either way. So I think in in you know, in my practice, we offer it as a routine to every single patient, um, and we'll continue to do that and yeah, see how see how we go. Okay, um, I see Dr. Hansraj Mangre has a comment. Hansi, go ahead. Uh, hi, Melinda. I just wanted to respond to Yashoda's uh, question was uh, on the learning curve. That was the one uh, question, and then she asked whether we're using the purse. So we, so we are using the purse as a single incision and a single port. So it's just an umbilical port. And uh, with regards to the learning curve, when you look at the principles of laparoscopy, this is a bit of a disjointed procedure because it's not it's not related to triangulation or sectorization. and you are doing a procedure that you have to visualize on the screen that's not also doesn't you know, sort of um, take into account instrumentation apart from using the needle. So what we found with the registrars and uh, you know, even, um, I mean, we previously did the one sort of symposium in Polokwane was even the consultants to, to conceptualize using that loop because we're using a single suture and creating a loop on the one end. And then we're using that loop to retrieve the other end and create that purse string it was was a bit difficult for some of them and i think once that was sort of uh, you know gathered within their minds and uh, uh, they could understand that then uh, we found that it wasn't as difficult but um, but i do agree that i mean some sort of laparoscopic experience is of value because you need to understand i mean the ergonomics of it and uh, the the one uh, just a response to what Celo asked was, uh, will you do it when it's found as as an incidental finding with other pathologies during laparoscopy? Then it depends on the pathology you're addressing, because I will personally will not do uh, elective inguinal hernia repair in a septic sort of abdomen with a perforated appendix. I would choose to rather sort out this appendicitis or the sepsis and then come back and treat the hernias at a later stage. Thanks, sir. Miller. Yeah, Hansi, I mean, I would agree with that in terms of, you know, if you find it as an incidental thing when you're doing other laparoscopy, um, you know, we would tend not to, or it depends on what the, the indication is. Um, but absolutely, if it's a septic abdomen, those types of things, we wouldn't consider repairing it simultaneously. Um, so I misunderstood uh, Celo's question slightly uh, from that perspective. But yeah, Hansi, I mean, it's yeah, it's it's interesting to hear what you were saying about being. It is a different kind of laparoscopy um, and sort of you know technique as opposed to routine laparoscopy, as you say, when you talk about triangulation, and everything. Yeah. Th thank you, Hansi. Uh, any of the juniors who are attending, do they want to ask any question? Please just unmute yourself and ask the question. Sorry, Malin, to interrupt. Yes, just no uh, two, two more comments. Uh, the one is that, uh, you know, we li limited our practice uh, to doing PERS on kids older than six months. Uh, and that's because we use that sort of, um, they use younger, younger children as part of the training to do operative uh, the open sort of operative technique. And uh, the other, I just wanted to add that, uh, so Elliot uh, Mutlong has set up a, uh, his third laparoscopic symposium. Uh, that's on the 27th to the 29th of October. And apparently he's lined up about 50 inguinal hernias. So we're gonna go up and, uh, you know, sort of uh, conduct this uh, symposium with him. If anybody's interested to join us, then they're welcome to contact uh, Elliot. Uh, that's that's very good uh, information, uh, Hansi. I think he's doing <clears throat> he's doing good work there with uh, support from you and support from Professor Chapularo. 
Um, so any, any junior wants to ask any question? Okay, I don't see any hands raised, anybody unmuted. So Andrew, I'm going to ask you to just give final comments before we wrap up uh, the meeting. Yeah, thanks and thanks for that. Um, yeah, as I, I think I said as the beginning, I think you know we need to push ourselves to advance and uh, to improve pediatric surgery for our patients um, and for you know our, ourselves and our colleagues. And that, but I think it's you know it's with the with the view of an understanding that we still need to be safe um, surgeons and we still need to have the the outcomes of our patients. Um, as the baseline, as, as the most important fundamental, but we still need to push the boundaries and to to get to you know the next level. Um, and but yeah, fortunately we work in we don't work in isolation. There's lots of supporting people and lots of supporting services, and you know there's people with more experience, and it's good to draw on those those experiences and those notes. Um, and yeah, but thanks for the invitation. It's really nice to be able to chat with everyone and catch up with everybody and to hear what other, what other people are, are doing in the same sort of sphere. Thank you so much. No, thank you, Andrew. And um, I will uh, uh, post the recording of uh, the link to the recording uh, in a short while. And for some unforeseen circumstances and reasons, we are going to halt these meetings for the time being. And uh, we will let you know when we restart the meetings. So in the present series, this is going to be the last meeting. So thank you, everybody. Um, have a good uh, evening or, or good night, wherever you are. Andrew, thank you once again. Hope to see you physically sometime in the near future. Okay. Thanks, Bob. Good to okay. see you. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Bye.